somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Et qui défendait la liberté d'expression. The moment you limit free speech is not free speech. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. Welcome to Clear and Present Danger, a history of free speech by Jakob Mshengama. Clear and Present Danger relies on the generous support of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, Fridor, and the Politiken Foundation. Episode 4, Expert Opinion, featuring Professor Paul Cartledge. It's a real honor to welcome as the very first guest on our inaugural Expert Opinion, Paul Cartledge, who is the A.G. Leventis Emeritus Professor of Greek Culture and a Senior Research Fellow at Clare College, Cambridge University. Professor Kartlech has a stellar resume and is one of the world's leading experts on ancient Greece. He is the author of many books, including Ancient Greek Political Thought and Practice from Cambridge University Press 2009 and Democracy, a Life from Oxford University Press 2016, which will soon be available in paperback, so look out for that. If you love studying the world of ancient Greece, you will not only have read Professor Cartlett's work, you will also have heard his always entertaining and enlightening voice on podcasts such as In Our Time, History Extra and History Hit. And not only is Professor Cartlett an expert on the Athenian democracy that we dealt with in episode one, he has actually listened to the episode, giving us a unique opportunity to delve more deeply into some of the central issues, as well as some of those we only touched upon. The interview was made via Sendcaster, so the sound is not as good as in the regular episodes. Thank you very much for talking to me today. It's a privilege to have you on the show. It's a great pleasure, Jakob. Thank you for inviting me. I'm obviously a newcomer to the history of the Athenian democracy and more familiar with the history of free speech in, in the modern era. And so to me, it's, it's almost incredible that some 2,500 years ago, a culture evolved where you could not only speak your mind freely, but where this value was prized as, as fundamental. How do you explain the origins of Isagoria and Parisia? We have to go back to the origins of politics in Greece, one of the distinctive features of the ancient Greeks, of which, by the way, there were many, many different cities, different communities. There was no one Greek state. Ancient Greece was a mixture of lots and lots of different communities, about a thousand of them in all. But we have to go back to the beginning where the very notion of citizenship emerges. Now, this is exclusive. It's only for adult males free of the proper birth. So that knocks out about 80 or 90 percent of the total population. But nevertheless, within that small group, they develop the notion of equality coupled with freedom. And it's actually at the root of one of those two words that you quoted at me, isegoria, the notion of isos, which is the same as in isosceles triangle, equality. That's the is bit. The egoria bit comes from the Greek word agora, which means a gathering, a public gathering, and then the place where you gather, and then the place where you speak. And from agora, the Greeks developed to ekklesia, that is when people are called out to gather and then to speak in public. This is all a very peculiar development. It's rather hard to explain why and how exactly it developed, but that is the essence of isegoria. The parisia is more common. In other words, there have been other communities where it's okay to speak freely. The key thing is who is allowed to speak, in what circumstances, and about what. And we tend to think that the Greeks were particularly exercised by, particularly interested in, politics. That is, the making of important decisions that affect a whole community by the relevant members of that community after free public speech. Is it even possible to imagine parousia in the ancient world 
outside a radically egalitarian democracy as Athens was uh, compared to anywhere else at the time? Well, no, I think you're right to imply that there is a, a distinction between a democracy and uh, another kind of political community. The essence of democracy, the etymological essence, is demos and kratos. Kratos means power, demos means the people, and that means the relevant adult male citizen people. So we're talking about um, a form of self-governance whereby an entity that is called in some sense the people decides for itself. And the freedom of speech, the frankness of speech, goes more with a type of community which is organized politically as a democracy than, and this is the, if you like, the opposite end of the spectrum, the other main notion and version of ancient Greek political organization was oligarchy, rule of a few. Aristotle, the greatest commentator and analyst of ancient Greek politics, thought that the two were mutually exclusive because democracy was essentially the rule of the poor, whereas oligarchy was essentially the rule of the rich citizens. There were variations of both types, but they were antithetical in that respect. And so obviously there's greater freedom for ordinary people. This is the key distinction for poor, humble not elite people in a democracy, whereas in an oligarchy, the rich and by extension, well-born, well-educated, tend to um, keep for themselves the ability to speak freely, frankly, and in public on political matters. Two of the champions of, of democracy and freedom were Pericles and later on Demosthenes. If we had a time machine and transported uh, Pericles and Demosthenes to a contemporary liberal democracy, what would they think of our modern rights-based and universalist understanding of free speech, you think? Well, there are two words in that formulation of yours which I think pick out a couple of essential differences between their democracy and indeed their politics and what we might call ours, that is, if you like, Western liberal democracy. And one of those two words is indeed liberal, where we understand that our system in some way um, permits, encourages the individual to have some sort of separation from and freedom from central we use the word state, imposition or organization. The ancients didn't have that notion of the individual. There was no ancient Greek word for an individual. They didn't have the notion of, if you like, capital S, state, which is a central body with all the main organs of power, the army, the government, and so on. They didn't think of that as something other than them. They were the state, the community. And then the other word that's not particularly appropriate, I think, for ancient Greece, and by the way, both those words, liberal and this other one, rights, they come originally not from Greek, but from Latin and uh, uh, from German, actually. But the rights notion is... I think not everybody quite agrees with me. Uh, I should say that not everything I say is universally agreed by all my colleagues. But um, rights talk, typically, and rights is a development of a post, um, post-Reformation, early modern um, political development, first theorized, crystallized in the writings of John Locke, in the late 17th century and during the 18th century by the thinkers who lay behind and took part in first the uh, American Revolution, the North American Revolution, and then secondly the French Revolution. So rights are entrenched, they're legally binding, they empower the individual against the state as well as uh, encourage him or her to take part in various things. The ancients had the opposite view. You're privileged, you're a participant sharer in the political process, and you have a duty to um, take advantage of those privileges that you receive from being a citizen. And what about the idea of, of universalism, the idea that, that everyone, every citizen in the world, no matter where they live, no matter what culture they belong to, has the right to free speech, to, to parousia, 
would that be alien to them as well? I mean, the Athenians and, and the Greeks tended to distinguish between themselves and, and so-called barbarians. So, so would this idea of universalism be alien to them? I think it would. Uh, and both universal and global are, of course, Latin-based words. But that's really um, rather trivial. The thing is that they did not have a notion of human rights or privileges. They didn't have a notion really of rights, but they didn't therefore, by definition, have the, the post-1940s um, universal declaration of human rights, which was uh, uttered uh, at the formation of the United Nations in 1948. They didn't know. They were exclusivist. They were not inclusivist. And they were exclusivist in a very strong sense that's to say, within their own communities, they were also exclusive. That's to say, they excluded women, they excluded foreigners, and almost uh, obviously, because they were slave-based communities, slave being an unperson, almost a dead um, person in terms of um, having any um, real identity, they also excluded all slaves. We tend to focus a lot on, on Athens uh, when it comes to democracy, but Athens was not the only democracy in ancient Greece. Did the other democratic city-states also build on the, on the values of Isagoria and Parousia, or was it specific to Athens? We know most about Athens, partly because Athens became, if you like, the cultural capital of the ancient Greek world, and it was the dominant state in terms of producing literature about itself and written records. They actually made a fetish of producing their laws, their decrees in public and having them permanently enshrined on bronze or stone. And so there was tons of stuff available. When the Romans conquer the Greek world, Athens is one of its two cultural capitals. The other one is Alexandria. Alexandria is more scientific and in terms of technical information, Athens is the great uh, founder of democracy and all that went with it in terms of, for example, oratory. And you mentioned Demosthenes before, you mentioned Pericles before. These are great orators. And being a politician was being an orator in an ancient Greek democratic political context. So the Athenians were, as it were, the emblematic Greeks. And unfortunately, we don't therefore have very much in the way of information about the details of the constitutional arrangements, let alone the ethos, that's to say the way in which, um, for example, the people of Argos, who were often democratic, they had a democratic constitution, but we don't know what they thought about freedom of speech and about um, other ways of speaking in public, frankly. All we can say, I think, is for sure that they would have accepted the Athenians' notion of freedom and equality, such that all citizens, in some sense, would be treated equally and have an equal say, and they would all be equally free to have a say about what they were going to decide in their public assemblies and other public ways of making decisions. You've written a lot on Sparta, and I think I've, I've even seen you described as a laconophile. In modern culture, Athens and Sparta are often portrayed as, you know, fire and water with completely opposite values and systems of governance. Is that a fair description when it comes to free speech as well? I mean, Demosthenes seems to make uh, that very uh, point in one of his speeches. Well, he does. Demosthenes says something like in um, Sparta, you can't um, say anything about the, the local political arrangements. You can't criticize them. Whereas in Athens, even an Athenian citizen can have a go at the Athenian democratic political system, can utter um, criticisms of it. They were in many respects different. They're not totally different. There's, if you like, a spectrum between Sparta and Athens. It overlaps to some extent in some respects. But in terms of freedom of speech, Sparta was ultimately a military society. And this is, I think, a universal pretty much that very few armies, uh, if any, have ever been uh, democracies. In other words, where everybody can have a say, an equal say, and then they make a decision by majority vote. In Sparta, they had assemblies, but the way they voted is very revealing. They voted by shouting. So suppose you're a six foot four hulk and you've got a really deep bass resonant voice. Your voice, you're worth more 
than somebody who's a rather smaller person with a lighter uh, timbre to his voice. Well, that de denies the very principle of one citizen, one vote, which is the fundamental democratic notion of equality in its political sense. So the Spartans, a military society, top down, didn't have the notion of equality, fundamental, and they also didn't have various things that the Athenians thought were central to doing democracy. For example, there were no popular jury courts in Sparta. There was no um, choosing of officials by the use of the random lottery, which is, of course, a very egalitarian system, and so on. So Sparta clearly, though it had certain public popular elements, was not a democracy in anything like an Athenian sense. What about Parasia? What if you were a, a Spartan and you were to say, I'm deeply opposed to the way that we treat the helots. Uh, I, I want to speak out for the inherent worth of the helots, and we've got to stop treating them uh, as slaves. Would, would that have been tolerated as well? Well, it's a very, very good question because helots were called slaves by the Spartans and they were unfree. They were compelled to live and work the way they did. They didn't have a free choice in where they lived, how they lived. They had no privileges or any safeguards. They could be killed um, at a whim. The, the state, the, the Spartan community declared war on them, all, all of them, at the beginning of each um, new civil year. But what's odd is the helots were Greeks, and there was a famous occasion when some Athenians came over, and they were allied to the Spartans at the time. Helots had revolted, uh, as they did periodically, uh, for freedom, basically, and the um, Athenians were a bit shocked to discover that these helots, they thought they were just like their own slaves, who would have been non-Greeks, and a, a sort of motley crew, not a uniform people, they started taking the side of the helots and they were instantly dismissed by the Spartans. So safe to say that Parasia was not embedded in Spartan culture? Absolutely not. There would be no way in which um, I think any ordinary Spartan could ever utter what he really thought without risking um, being denounced and possibly worse. There was no isegoria, as I've already said, because they didn't have this notion of equality, one citizen, one vote. So in all those ways, Sparta's an outlier. We, we sometimes talk of the ancient Greeks invented democracy, the ancient Greeks invented freedom, and they invented freedom of speech. Well, yes, some of them did, but the Spartans certainly did not. Unfortunately, I, I didn't have much time to dedicate to the issue of drama, such as comedy and tragedy, but the plays of Aristophanes, Euripides, Sophocles seem to touch on burning political questions of their day, and also often to be pretty explicit and hard-hitting in their criticism of specific characters like Socrates and Cleon. What role did drama play for the Athenians, and what were the limits, legal or moral? It's an extremely good question. We tend to think of theatre as something that privately one goes to the theatre, that it has, yes, it might be about politics, but it is not directly likely to have much impact on actual political decision making. The Athenians who invented the genre of tragedy and indeed um, played a key role in inventing the genre of comedy. For them, theatre was a form of, a branch of politics. And so the central space, the theatre of Dionysus, the god of theatre, the god also of wine, was, not surprisingly, absolutely central on a slope of the Acropolis. So it couldn't have been more um, central, more obviously um, where politics typically was going to be happening. And the Athenian audience was eventually paid actually to attend. It was thought to be so important that they attended the theatre that they were given money to enable them to pay to go if they were short of that uh, amount of cash. 
However, unlike our theatre, which is pretty much year round, and of course it's indoors, ancient Greek theatre was ritual, ritualized, and it happened at Athens just twice a year in official religious festivals in honour of Dionysus. Now, you mentioned tragedy, you mentioned comedy. There was a third type of drama, it's called the satyr drama, and satyrs were half man, half beast, sort of horse and goats, and they were thought to represent a sort of humorous release side of the uh, collective spirit. So they did things which normally human beings were not allowed to do. But the combination of those three, um, each genre had its greatest representatives. And you quite rightly mentioned Euripides. There's a famous passage of um, one of his plays, which uh, in your podcast you mentioned because Milton quoted it at the start of his Areopagitica of 1644. But there is one that you didn't mention there. I would give him a, a very strong central role. His name is Aeschylus. And he is the author of the earliest surviving play, Tragedy. It's the Persians of 472 BC. It's set in a contemporary setting. This is very unusual. Most tragedies are set in a dim, distant, mythical past, and very often not set in Athens. So this is set actually uh, in the Persian court, and it's a play about a major naval battle that had been fought only seven or eight years before the play was performed. And one of the functions was to draw out what was it that enabled the Greeks to beat the Persians. And so what were the differences between the way the Persians organized their um, power structure and the way the Athenians and other Greeks organized theirs? And so Aeschylus plays on key elements of what it is to be a democratic citizen as opposed to a subject of an autocratic dictator, a despot such as the Persian king. The Greeks have a system whereby their leaders are responsible to the people who put them in the position of leadership. That is absolutely key, whereas in Persia it's entirely top-down autocratic monarchy of a dictatorial, tyrannical kind. It's a bit the same point, I guess, that Herodotus tries to make when he uh, explains why the Athenians became the most powerful of the Greeks. That's a very, very good point. Of course, Herodotus' main subject, he, he dealt with an awful lot of stuff. He wrote about a past that covered about 100 years, but he focuses on 480, 479 BC. He focuses on Greek versus Persian. He doesn't disguise that there are differences within the Greeks, that some of them actually fought on the Persian side willingly. And um, he does, as you say, make this famous statement that the Athenians, before they had isegoria, that freedom of uh, speech, that equality of free political speech, they weren't anything. They didn't m amount to much in battle. But once they got that isegoria, key bit of democracy, then they beat the Persians at the Battle of Marathon. So if you like, Aeschylus majors on the Battle of Salamis, uh, Herodotus kicks off with the Battle of Marathon, and then he, ten years later, he's describing the Battle of Salamis, and you can actually put side by side Aeschylus's description, Herodotus' description, and their inference, and they are on the same side, both descriptively and theoretically and ideologically, if you like. The true measure of free speech is, of course, where you draw the limits, and there were important limits in Athens as well. Could you describe the role that religion played, both in Athenian politics in general, and how that impacted on the limits of Parisia? The Greeks were not totally tolerant by any means. So they um, encouraged freedom and they encouraged freedom of speech especially, but as you rightly say, limits. And one of the limits was blasphemy. Another of the limits was advocacy of political system radically opposed to democracy. We have similar issues, don't we, within our own um, um, free politics as to whether or not people can freely advocate Nazism, racism, say, and whatever, whatever. There, there are needs to police free speech. Free speech has its costs. 
Well, the, as you rightly say, the Greeks' main, if you like, red line concerned relations between humans and the gods, what we call religion. The Greeks didn't have a single word. They talked about the matters to do with the gods, the proper way of dealing with the gods, the proper acknowledgement of them. And so there were laws against um, blasphemy. There were laws uh, very broadly in piety. The question was, of course, what counted as not respecting the gods and who was to decide that? Well, interestingly, in a democracy where you have a, a public legal system, a jury system of jurors who are chosen by lot, it's actually they who in any particular instance, when somebody might be accused of impiety, they decide whether or not it actually has been committed. And they might decide not on any very narrow technical definition of what counts as being impious, but more was that sort of behavior the sort of thing that would anger the gods, that would risk the relationship between the human community and the divine getting sour, such that the gods would be angry and then wish to um, impose punishment? And broadly speaking, that's the context in which I think we're both building up, aren't we, towards a famous instance of the test of what counts of impiety, and that is the trial of Socrates in 399 BC, BCE. Exactly. We'll get to that very shortly. But first, this is one of the questions that has vexed me a little bit, because there seems to be a lot of uncertainty as to how often the law against impiety was used, depending on who you read. One tradition lines up a whole range of Athenian or Greek greats that were supposedly tried and or convicted, beginning with Anaxagoras and ending with uh, Aristotle. Others argue that the evidence for these trials is weak and that they serve to sort of embellish the reputation of these thinkers and philosophers later on. What's your verdict? There is one view, a scholarly view, that Socrates' trial is a fact and it was then misapplied, that fact, to cases where thinkers such as Anaxagoras, who famously at one point said the Peloponnese was, uh, uh, the, sorry, the sun was a red-hot stone rather larger than the Peloponnese, whereas most ordinary Greek Athenians, they thought that the sun was a god. Um, it's true, there is the view that Socrates' trial was a genuine trial, that Anaxagoras and co, they got called within um, this net, uh, and uh, later sources wrongly ascribed actual trials to these people, whereas in fact they just were controversial, if you like. But... Um, I'm, I suppose, of the view that it's not impossible that Anaxagoras might have been put on trial, but for this reason, not only because of his view, which is a theoretical, scientific view, but because of his association with Pericles. So in other words, suppose you don't like Pericles, you think he's too democratic, and you don't like Anaxagoras's um, theoretical views of science, which seem to you blasphemous and possibly atheistical, what you do is you prosecute Anaxagoras, but you're actually getting at Pericles. That, that's not an implausible scenario, but it's very difficult for us to evaluate the evidence later on. So we can, I think, stick to the one case, which is absolutely certain, which is Socrates. When we talked before the show, you mentioned that the impiety law, if it was used, might primarily have been used against non-Athenians and, and foreigners, in which case there might be a parallel to the Athenians who were later on expelled in, in Rome when the Romans during the Middle Republic thought that Athenian philosophy was uh, dangerous, it would corrupt the the aristocratic youth. Uh, is that a fair parallel to, to draw? And if so, uh, an ironic one? You are quite right that the Romans had a much more regular practice of expelling philosophers. And that is indeed because they were thought to be Greek and that was un-Roman. Though the Romans adopted lots of Greek things, they weren't so keen on pure theoretical speculation. But 
that therefore could mean that a lot of the evidence for supposed trials and expulsions or even executions of philosophers in classical Greece were wrongly so construed by sources writing under the Roman imperial uh, era. I quite agree with that. And it would be um, ironic, paradoxical, even if um, Anaxagoras had been the first. But on the other hand, um, it's, as I say, not impossible that um, Anaxagoras in particular, who is before Socrates, I mean, they're contemporaries, but he was exiled uh, and or executed earlier than Socrates. There's no question about that. It's, I think, possible that it was his association with um, Pericles. And this leads us on, will lead us on, to one of the aspects of the Socrates case, which is precisely how political was it, as opposed to how religious or, if you like, theoretically, ideologically motivated. Yes, and I don't think we can postpone it anymore. This brings us to the issue, the trial of Socrates, which you have written about in your book on ancient Greek political thought from 2009. And you make the argument that the conviction was consistent with the Athenian law and that the interpretation of the trial as political is basically based on a modern understanding of free speech. Now, when I read that, uh, I have to admit, it was a quite a hard blow to my confirmation bias since I, I kind of liked the, the political interpretation of the trial. But since you've gone and ruined a foundational free speech myth, can you take us through why you've reached that conclusion? Well, I reached it for two reasons, really. One is that um, I think because of the timing and because of Socrates' connections and because of what we think about the way in which the Athenians were doing politics around the turn of the 5th to the 4th century BC, there's a tendency to want Socrates to have been um, summonsed and found guilty on largely political, that is, um, in terms of oligarchy versus democracy, basically, uh, grounds. And that view is reinforced. Uh, it's uh, almost sort of a given because the two main sources for the trial of Socrates, Plato and Xenophon, who were both in some sense pupils, at any rate followers of Socrates, were themselves not Democrats. They were, in fact, anti-Democrats, extremely so in the case of Plato, and less virulently so in the case of Xenophon. But neither of them approved of the power of the masses. They did not approve of the equality for all people to speak. They did not agree, believe that ordinary people in the majority should have power over the elite. So it's, there's an obvious sort of thought that, oh, well, therefore Socrates' trial must have been a political decision. It must have been mainly, chiefly about the issue of was Socrates or was he not an anti-democrat? Whereas if you look at the charge sheet against him, and this is where we have it, it's much, much later, but it preserves very accurately the sort of wording that one would have predicted. He's charged much more elaborately on a religious charge. And this, this, the next charge, that is the one it says in Greek, corrupting or destroying the young, is both vague and very brief. The religious charge had to be spelled out because it was complicated. And he was accused of two things, one positive, one negative. He was accused of, on one hand, introducing new gods that the city of Athens had not recognized. So he was somehow threatening or somehow not abiding by the very elaborate arrangements the Athenians made for deciding which were the appropriate gods, which gods were, as it were, official, that could and should be worshipped, and which gods, on the other hand, either were not, they'd been rejected, or they had not yet been added on and included. And then the other half of it was that he didn't negatively duly worship 
the gods that were established, that were in the official pantheon. So he's guilty of two sorts of religious offence, which would have had the consequence. Now, this is what the Athenians didn't need spelling out. The gods that were not duly uh, worshipped would have been angry that they weren't being duly worshipped. And the ones that Socrates was worshipping personally, well, for all the Athenians knew, that might have been another negative force that was actually doing harm to them, might have been doing good to Socrates as he saw it. So the Athenians were being asked, the 501 jurors, by the prosecutor, who is not a politician, it's very significant, he's not known to have performed any significant political role whatsoever. He was, I think, picking up on a general anxiety and angst in the Athenian uh, body politic caused by a number of very disturbing uh, affairs and events, the plague, terrible destruction, a third of the adult males possibly destroyed, just 20, 30 years before, think of the effect, no uncles, no grandfathers of the 501 jurors. And then they'd lost the war. Why had they lost this major war when they really thought they should have done? The gods must have been angry with them. Ah, yes, some idiots had gone and smashed some images of the god Hermes. Well, that wasn't a very clever thing to do. Some other idiots, and famously this included Alcibiades, who in your podcast um, featured very strongly and often negatively and quite rightly, um, a number of other Athenians were accused of holding mystery celebrations, that is, in honour of goddess Demeter, who is the earth mother goddess, absolutely fundamental agricultural goddess, and her daughter, known as Persephone, Athenians were accused of not properly worshipping them, of worshipping them in private, not in public, and there was some sort of suggestion possibly even parodying the rites as opposed to performing them accurately but illegally. At any rate, the combination of all these, I think, plus add in, if you like, Anaxagoras, add in the play that Aristophanes wrote about Socrates specifically, in terms of religion, that is, Socrates has replaced, for example, Zeus with the god Whirlpool. Well, that's a pretty weird thing to do. You're no longer worshipping Zeus, you're worshipping a, a natural force that you can't represent in human form as they represented all their other gods, so on and so on. So I think the religious charge tended to be underplayed. Now, I don't wish to deny that many of the audience, many of the 501, also had in mind Socrates' connection with Alcibiades and with, um, in particular, Critias, the yeah. leader of the 30 who ran Athens for about a year. And they were terrific oligarchs and very, very pro-Spartan. Spartans sent a garrison to support them and so on. So, yes, they're all tied up, but I suppose I'm going, in a way, overboard. I'm going too far the other way, but I'm trying to correct the impression that it was just a political issue. It was also a, a theoretical and religious issue. What should we make of Socrates himself, I mean, he used parousia to spectacular effect and, and refused to compromise, uh, even at the, the cost of his own death. But it's not clear to me that he actually believed in parousia and particularly isagoria as governing principles applicable to all. So in other words, was Socrates both a martyr and a champion of free speech? And was he a martyr at all? Yes. Well, what was he a martyr to? That, that would be the problem, I think. He certainly, as represented by mainly Plato, did not have a school as, for example, Plato and uh, Isocrates were to have. He um, wandered around specifically within the city walls of Athens. He barely went outside Athens except when he went away to fight, which he did a couple of times and apparently very bravely as well. So he's very. He saved the life of Alcibiades, I believe. Yes. He's a terrific urbanite. 
And um, he's a, a, a philosopher of the highways and byways. Anybody he happened to run into was liable to um, get pinned down by him. But we have to remember that what we have about him is very much doctored evidence. It's polished, it's produced by uh, Plato and secondarily by Xenophon. It doesn't actually correspond to the actual way in which uh, Socrates' conversations would have gone. So I think he probably um, was a believer in free exchange of ideas, but he was also pretty clearly not theoretically, ideologically, a Democrat in the sense that he thought that every citizen was relevantly equal. He thought some were more equal than others, to coin the Orwellian phrase. And Plato picked up on that. Plato refined that. Plato went much further, possibly, than Socrates. Socrates may have been a much better democratic citizen than Plato, we don't know of any office that Plato held, whereas we know that Socrates was a counsellor, for example. So um, it, it is a little bit ambivalent. Speaking of Plato, of course, we know of Socrates chiefly through Plato, but he doesn't seem to have been a huge fan of Isagoria and Parisia, and as you mentioned, certainly not of democracy, even though Athens gave him the freedom to set up an academy and write critically of its political system. So what's Plato's legacy when it comes to free speech? I mean, he is, after all, one of the, if not the most important philosophers in the Western tradition. Yes, um, there is a view that he uh, is the founding father of philosophy. Actually, the word philosophia first appears in Plato, and it's possible he coined it. In other words, he gave a particular definition to sophia, which means a knack, a skill, as well as wisdom. He gave it a particular meaning of intellectual intelligence and insight. And based on intellection, his view that only those who know, as opposed to merely believe, only those tiny few elite people who have this extraordinary intellectual capacity and insight to understand the way the world really is and what values are and should be. He, therefore, in his both ideal um, theoretical sort of imaginings, and I think probably in his advice to his pupils, advocated what you and I would call extreme oligarchy of an intellectual kind. Now, the difference between a, a regular oligarch and Plato is that Plato did not think wealth alone or birth alone in terms of pedigree were sufficient criteria for rule. You have to be smart. You have to understand what he called the forms, the underlying essences which give to what you and I perceive on a daily basis their um, actuality. But only the very few actually know that behind the very deceptive appearances are these eternal, unchanging essences. And so he wrote um, a dialogue in which Socrates is the principal interlocutor with, for example, a couple of his own brothers were used as characters called the Republic. And that formulates a version of an ideal city, which is pretty impractical. And I think probably people said to him, look, Plato, we understand that you're not a Democrat, that you want to reform politics, not just democratic politics, but all politics. Give us a much more pragmatic blueprint, or at least suggest some ideas as to how in you know practical reality we could go about setting up a, a better form of community. So he wrote something called the laws. And the word laws is used because what the three discussants do is they lay down a, a new code, which by the way includes a very strong prohibition of atheism. It would be okay to execute somebody if they utter, speak, um, atheistical things. So he's very much not a proponent of the freedom of speech, which his own city, Athens, by and large, allowed him and people like him to exercise. Is it fair to go so far as accusing Plato of totalitarian tendencies as Karl Popper famously did? Well, the, the thinking behind that is, of course, because Popper and others were experiencing actual 
totalitarianism in the 20s and 30s, fascism, Nazism, Soviet communism. I think there's a risk of anachronism here. The ancient community is different. They didn't have police powers, the surveillance powers. There were no parties that could impose a party line, the Nazi party, the fascist party, the Bolshevik party, and so on. So the danger is of picking out certain elements of Plato's thought which are certainly authoritarian. They're collectivist top-down, and there is a small hardcore of cadres, if you like, who have um, they uh, bought the, the party line. I'm using these terms anachronistically because that's where I think people saw the common... common um, what was in common between Plato's thinking and totalitarian thinking and practice of the 20th century. But I don't think it's quite fair to uh, label Plato a totalitarian. In episode two, I dealt with Rome from the Republic until its transformation to a principate. We covered the period up to Tiberius, who initiated a number of, of treason trials, including against historians. And of course, Greek culture, including oratory, became very important in Roman culture as well. But the Roman model of free speech seems a lot more elitist than the Athenian one. Cicero famously blamed the popular assemblies and their licentiousness for the decay of, of Greece. So how would you compare the level of free speech enjoyed by democratic Athens during the golden age of Pericles with the Romans in the late Republic during the time of Cicero, Cato and so on? Yeah, I'd say there's no comparison, meaning that it would be wrong to think that the Roman Republic was the same sort of entity of political regime as a democratia of the Greek type as experienced, as developed most fully by the Athenians. They're really very different sorts of entities. And if I can give you just one way of thinking about that, the Romans did not ever formulate, they're more like Spartans in this respect, they didn't ever formulate the notion of one citizen having an equal say and an equal vote so that every citizen was in some sense politically equal to every other. In their many voting assemblies, and they had both legislative and electoral assemblies, there was a people of Rome, so in that sense um, they're not... Um, very, very elitist uh, in principle. There is a, a notion of the people of Rome. Nevertheless, they were always controlled by the fact that they voted as a group, and the groups were very often slanted to um, the wealthiest. So in other words, the weighting of the voting power within the various assemblies, both electoral and legislative, was very heavily towards the, the wealthy. So that if a Greek were to analyze the uh, Roman Republican political constitution, he would call it an oligarchy of a timocratic kind. And the Greek word timi means value or worth or price. So in other words, timocracy is power, crassy, in accordance with how rich you are, what your economic value is. So that the Roman Republic is a timocratic oligarchy with popular political elements. Another way of looking at it, another way of drawing a distinction between anything that the Romans did and anything that a Greek democracy did, the Romans had assemblies. They had the ability, the ordinary people could uh, pitch up and listen to, for example, candidates um, who were going for public office. But one absolutely key mode of doing politics the Romans did not have that the Greeks had, and that is a decision-making assembly. In other words, people pitching up, listening to opposing views, and then making a decision which was binding after a majority vote on the community as a whole. They simply never had such a system of popular government. And sometimes ancient Greek democracy is called government by mass meeting. Well, the Romans were very frightened, as you rightly said in your introduction, Cicero, when he's contrasting the way the terrible Greeks did things and the way we good Romans do it. They're very, he's very hostile to the kind of speechifying which he 
rather rudely calls merely rabble rousing um, as a way of actually doing politics. He thinks that what went on in the Senate, which uh, incorporated all the current office holders and past office holders, a real power elite, he thought that was superior, that mode of um, political action to anything that a, an open Greek assembly of ordinary poor people having the power to decide something. So what the Athenians would allow as parousia, the Romans would think of as licentia, as, as going too far, it would be dangerous to allow the uneducated commoners, the unwashed mob, to participate in an equal footing in, in politics and public debate. If I could sum it up in a sentence, you mentioned the word libertas. For them, Roman libertas was a privilege of the elite, whereas if you were to dissipate that privilege and give it to the masses, it would degenerate for a Roman upper-class person into licentia, license. That's exactly right. Whereas a Greek would say, isigure equals eleutheria, freedom, and parousia is a way of being free. We often invoke Athens in modern discussions about democracy, or at least mention the Athenian democracy, even though very few of us would perhaps like to model our representative democracy on the Athenian uh, model. I found it exceedingly rare that modern discussions on free speech mention the heritage of Athens uh, in these discussions. Why is that, you think? I think there are two main reasons. The first is this, that almost all the surviving writers from ancient Greece and from ancient democratic Athens were not themselves democrats. They were more or less anti-democrats for the simple reason they were elite people Ancient Athenian and Greek democracy was typically an either anti-elite or non-elite system, which disadvantaged you if you were an elite, because there were very few elite people as opposed to the mass of ordinary citizens. So the tradition about ancient democracy from wherever you take it to begin, I suppose, um, Thucydides, you could go back to Herodotus, but it's predominantly anti-democratic. And that tradition comes all the way down through Cicero, who was immensely influential throughout the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, then the early modern period. Then when the notion of the people having a say, and indeed even having a decisive say in politics, arose again after centuries of oligarchy and monarchy, including divine right monarchy, including in our, my own country, Charles I, for example, believed he ruled by divine right. The dominant trend of populist or popular politics was more Roman than it was Greek, because the Romans had themselves said these things, such as Cicero had said, about Greek democracy. So when, for example, in the United States, the founding fathers decided what to call their main political, or some of their main political um, offices, they chose the word Senate, They didn't choose the Greek word, which would have been bouli, council. And they chose to call the place where um, politics happened in Washington, D.C., the Capitol Hill, not the Acropolis. And they, the founding fathers, in particular Madison, were especially aggravated and anxious about one particular thing, which they called faction. So in other words, political disagreement, debate, that's fine. But faction is characteristic, they thought, of a system of politics in which a free-for-all enables the mob to get the upper hand. So it's a kind of mob rule politics, which they, the founding fathers of the Americans, thought was um, disgraceful and possibly dangerous. The French revolutionaries, within them, there was a if you like, a left wing, some of whom did have some sympathy for 
uh, ancient Greece, they knew a little bit about Demosthenes and so they knew Demosthenes spoke for freedom, that he was against a monarch, Philip II. So, you know, this is all acceptable. But the dominant Western tradition has been Roman based and anti democratic. Should we read that into, for instance, when Edmund Burke argued that a perfect democracy is the most shameless thing in the world? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think by perfect, he must have meant totally uh, the demos bit, meaning the ordinary people in the mass, so the poor, therefore ignorant, stupid, fickle, uh, in general, um, disgraceful. Perfect democracy being therefore the ultimate in the wrong sort of way of doing politics, which should be um, guided by and dominated by wise, well-educated, elite persons who knew what they were talking about and didn't merely go on emotion. You mentioned James Madison, but Alexander Hamilton, I think, also wrote quite mockingly of Pericles in, in the Federalist Papers, number six, I think it is, uh, something like Pericles in compliance with the resentment of a prostitute was basically the source of, of Athens' ruins. Is that a, a good example of this sort of condescending attitude that these very influential Enlightenment figures had towards the Athenian model of democracy? Completely right. And there's an interesting further dimension to that. How did Hamilton believe that? Where did he get such a, a scurrilous accusation against Pericles? Well, precisely because the Athenians believed in freedom of speech, freedom of expression, precisely because theatre was a popular political activity, Comedy is the source of these negative, these really horrible accusations um, that Pericles' private life was really very, very um, disreputable. So it's because precisely of the way in which the Athenians did democratic politics and theatre that there is this evidence which comes to uh, Hamilton through Plutarch. Plutarch knew these plays. He read the texts and he preserved them in his biography of Pericles. So anti-democrats, or at least anti um, the sort of democracy that the Athenians practiced, people like that, they seized on anything that would make ancient practitioners of that sort of politics seem um, disreputable. Rather rich coming from Alexander Hamilton, who was not exactly faithful to his own wife. Couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Okay, we've reached the last question. Um, I'd love to continue the discussion, but I know that you have to jet off to a conference in Colorado. What has been the legacy of Isigoria and Parisia, and are there still important lessons other than purely historical ones for people in our digital age? Well, we've agreed that there is very little, if any, direct legacy, precisely for the reasons that I gave. In other words, if we now, as some of us do, seek to recuperate or recover a link back, invent really, a link back to the ancient Greeks, because we find some of the things they did and thought admirable, then this is um, a conscious innovation on our part. And it is the case that the digital revolution has paradoxically made possible some version of what the ancients had to do in a way when they did democracy of their sort, namely direct democracy, government by mass public meeting. Well, we can have a global village, of course. We can be interconnected digitally, as we say, virtually. But I called it a paradox because it seems to me that this is made possible, even possibly encouraged, the worst kind of insult, um, identity politics, the sorts of things that Madison and co. saw as being characteristic of the ancient Greek democracy and was wholly undesirable, the sort of thing that Cicero accused the ancient Greeks of doing. We, it seemed to me now, don't use you know, social media, I tend to call them anti-social media for mutual enlightenment and reinforcement and instruction. But very often we tend to be, uh, it seems to me, using these media in a negative uh, way, partly to fake 
information, that is to lie, and partly to distort, that is suppress or represent our opponent's views or our own views very selectively. I'm old-fashioned, call me old-fashioned. I'm still a strong believer myself in parliamentary democracy, so long as our representatives behave decently and sensibly and responsibly. Professor Paul Cartlidge, thank you very much. It has been a privilege and an honour to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. It was a huge pleasure to be talking with you and to be part of your show. Today's episode was edited by Søren Stehøj. As always, please contact us on Facebook, Twitter, email, and do leave reviews on iTunes. Next episode will also be an expert opinion. It will feature the German scholar Dirk Roman for a talk elaborating on episode three, The Age of Persecution. 